This is the Unit 1 review for the AP Macroeconomics exam. I'm following along with your unit review from that unit, so you may want to have that out as well to stay organized. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the difference between positive and normative economics. Something you may have forgotten about because we haven't learned it since the first unit, but it does pop up in the AP exam. Positive economics states a fact, what is, something that is happening or happened in the past. The economy is currently fighting a recession. The economy is currently fighting inflation. Normative economics takes the fact and puts an opinion on top of it. What ought to be, should is a good keyword for this. The economy is currently fighting a recession. The government should increase spending. The economy is currently fighting inflation. The Federal Reserve should sell bonds. So setting an opinion on top of the fact. The next thing I want to talk about is the circular flow model. The first graph we learned, which you probably won't have to draw this on the AP exam, but it does show up conceptually. So in the circular flow model, we have the product market, which is the market for goods and services, also known as the expenditure approach in GDP, the C, the I, the G, the XN, and the factor market, which is dealing with the different types of resources. In the GDP calculation, that is the income approach, looking at all the incomes added together. In the factor market, we look at how households sell their resources to the firm. By that I mean their factors of production. They sell their land, they sell their labor, they sell their capital, and entrepreneurs um, sell their resources in order to be the inputs for the firm. The firms need these resources in order to produce a good or service. And in return for those resources, they pay our income. To be more specific, they pay our RIP our wages for our labor, the rent on our land, interest for capital, and entrepreneurs collect profit. And all of these make up the income that the households receive. The product market is pretty simple. Firms are the sellers in the product market. They sell their goods and services and the households buy them. And in return, the households pay for those goods and services, which creates revenue for the firms. And that's really it with the circular flow model. I keep it straight conceptually by just remembering firms are the sellers in the product market, households are the seller in the factor market. The next graph we're gonna learn though is a graph that you will most definitely see on the AP exam in the multiple choice and the free response section. It's the production possibilities graph. And this corresponds with the first graph of your graph review. So you may have the two types of goods of consumer and capital goods, or it may just be two random goods, good A and good B. Either way, we're measuring opportunity costs, what we're giving up of the next best alternative. Now with this graph, most of the time you'll see it as a bowed out curve. And if you're drawing it, that's the thing you're gonna to wanna to draw instead of a straight line, because it's more accurate. It's more accurate because it's of this thing called the law of increasing opportunity costs. And that looks at how, as we move along the PPC, our resources are not perfectly adaptable. So if I wanna produce less of good A and more in good B, I have to give up more the more of good B I'm producing, which is why the bowed out curve is more accurate. Now, on the macro exam, the most common thing I see is labeling how the economy is doing. And I label this by three points. The economy could be at full employment, at long run equilibrium, where we wanna be in the aggregate model where all three lines are crossing. That would be along the line, which is known as efficiency. We call this in macro more specifically, full employment, long run equilibrium, the natural rate of unemployment, all of those terms we use in the aggregate model. Or if it's a point inside the line, this means that we have the resources, but we're not using it, which is known as inefficiency or a recession. So this would be equivalent to drawing the aggregate model with the LRAS starting to the right of equilibrium. And a point outside the line represents inflation or unattainable. Because if you try and produce out here, you don't have the resources to be out there. You're gonna end up overproducing and creating inflation. So these are the three labels I see on the AP exam most often with macroeconomics. So another thing that you need to know the definitions of Allocative and productive efficiency. Productive efficiency describes any point along the PPC. Doesn't matter if you're making more consumer goods or more capital goods, as long as you're making the best use of your resources. Allocative efficiency just describes one point, the point in the exact middle point of the line. So we'll say this is the exact middle. 
and this represents the best combination and equal mix of capital and consumer goods, or where our marginal benefits equal our marginal costs. And this is the best combination for the present. So if it ever asked for what is the best combination of the two goods for right now for the present, it would be the allocative efficient point exactly in the middle of the line. Or it may ask, instead of what's the best combination for the present, what is the best combination for long run economic growth? And this is really important because this is something that repeats over and over and over again in macroeconomics. And that would be the emphasis on capital over consumer goods. So make sure capital, human capital, education and experience, physical capital, machinery and infrastructure. So focusing on capital over consumer goods, and we'd show this by a movement along the PPC, would lead to the whole curve eventually shifting out over time. You only shift the curve out to represent a total increase in resources and focusing on capital goods is what leads to that over time. So that's really everything with the production possibilities graph. And the next thing we're going to look at is supply and demand. Now supply and demand isn't as heavy on the macro test as it is on the micro and we really focus more on aggregate models but there's some things you still need to know from this graph for the AP exam. The first thing, because this applies in the aggregate model as well, price does not change demand and price does not change supply ever. It always changes the quantity, quantity demanded and quantity supplied. And this is explained by the law of demand and the law of supply, that relationship between price and quantity. For example, if prices were to increase, the demand wouldn't change, the quantity demanded would decrease, which I illustrate with a movement up along the line. And there are three reasons that describe this movement, describe the law of demand, that inverse relationship between price and quantity. The income effect, which shows that at higher prices, our income does not buy as much quantity as it did before. The substitution effect, with at a higher price, we switch to a substitute good, which is why we're able to decrease our quantity demanded, or diminishing marginal utility, which I use the examples of Oreos during class, me eating a ton of Oreos and decreasing satisfaction with each additional unit, or that idea of the only way I would be willing to buy a large quantity of something is if the price is super low or the definition of Costco. So all three of those describe the downward sloping demand line and the law of supply describes the upward sloping supply line where producers want to sell as much as they possibly can at a higher price. So with price, we don't know typically if it's quantity demanded or quantity supplied. So you do both if it just says the price increases. So if the price of a good increases, consumers are going to want to buy more. Quantity demanded goes up. Producers are not going to want to sell as much. Quantity supplied goes down, which creates a surplus because the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. Or the opposite, if prices were to decrease, consumers would want to buy more, but producers would not want to sell as much, which would create a shortage because the QD is greater than the QS. And sometimes the government creates these two examples of disequilibrium with this thing called artificial price controls. Artificial price controls are when the government sets a minimum price, known as a price floor, or a maximum price, known as a price ceiling. So a price floor, as I said, is a minimum price. This means that producers can charge it at this price or higher. They can never lower the price back down to equilibrium. And if the price is artificially high, producers are going to want to sell it, but consumers are not going to want to buy it, which is why a price floor creates a surplus. A price ceiling is a maximum price on a good, meaning that can only sell it at this price or lower. So the price will always be too low, which is why it creates a shortage. And I know the labelings of these are super annoying. You have to remember you graph the price floor at the top, the price ceiling at the bottom. So this is what you do with price problems on supply and demand. Again, not changing the behavior, moving along the line. The things that actually change the behavior of supply and demand are those acronyms we learn to describe behavioral shifts. Tripe for demand. And this is taste and preferences, I prefer to wear what's in style, related goods, describing complements and substitutes, 
income de describing normal goods, which are luxury goods, and inferior goods, which are not as nice of goods. Population, which is talking about immigration, more people, more demand, and future expectations for the consumer. Supply, the behaviors that move supply, are gross. G stands for government. Anything to do with the government moves supply, subsidies, taxes, quotas. Resource cost is an important one because that one moves short and aggregate supply as well, and all six things fit into both graphs. Wars, wages, natural disasters, oil, steel, and lumber. O stands for other goods. You're going to sell the good which makes you the most profit. T also fits into aggregate models, technology, keywords, productivity, and efficiency. E stands for future expectations for the producer. They're going to want to sell it when the price is highest. And S stands for size of market. More producers, more supply, less producers, less supply. So if it fits into tripe or groats, it'll shift the entire supply line or the entire demand line. And when you shift these lines, your equilibrium changes. So for example, let's say wages increase. If wages go up, this is an example of a resource cost. Producers will not be able to sell as much, so your supply will decrease, which reminds me of an important thing. Do not say up or down on this graph. You will get everything backwards. Left, decrease. Right, increase. Write that at the top of your AP exam if you get those two things mixed up. So the whole supply line would decrease, which creates a new equilibrium and a new equilibrium price, which is higher than the original equilibrium price a new equilibrium quantity, which is lower than the original equilibrium quantity. So whenever you're measuring equilibrium changes, you're looking at where the old equilibrium compares to the new one and showing what happens to price and quantity. One last thing is the term elasticity. We don't cover this in depth in macro, but just for the definition basis, inelastic goods are necessities. You are willing to pay any price for them. Oil and water are great examples. Elastic goods are luxuries. You will not pay a higher price for them. So things you want instead of things you need. And that concludes the Unit 1 AP Macroeconomics Review.